You are following a man who claimed to be a prophet. He claimed to be a prophet because he wanted money, women, followers, slaves, power, and honor. He deceived all of you for his own benefit. This is why he fabricated the Quran and claimed it's from God. Unfortunately, we have reached the absolute bottom of ignorance today. To the extent that this claim is circling the internet, and surprisingly, some people believe it. Salamu alaikum, this is Dean Academy, and in this video, I will fully debunk the claim with evidence and references. So, get ready, bring your coffee, and let's start. Before I start, I want to tell you why is this refutation important for you. I'm not recording this video as a response to the Islamophobes themselves. If someone is fabricating a lie, he already knows he's a liar. He does not need someone to expose him to himself. I am recording this video mainly for truth seekers, especially those who have watched the 8-hour Evidence of Islam series. Also for young Muslims who haven't started learning Sira yet and are getting some doubts because of their lack of knowledge. After we presented more than 200 pieces of evidence of Islam, we agreed that supernatural miracles are not enough for us to follow a specific man. Evil entities too can do some supernatural stuff. Devils, jinn, magicians and the Dajjal are obvious examples of parties who can demonstrate supernatural powers. So confirming that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him made hundreds of miracles is not enough for us to follow him. We also need to know who he is first. And what is he asking us to do? There is always a chance of an evil person trying to spread his evil through performing supernatural miracles, right? We need to ask ourselves a lot of questions before we follow the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him. For example, did he gain any wealth by preaching Islam? Did he gain any power and honor by preaching Islam? Did he gain any worldly desires by preaching Islam that he didn't have before? Could he have been a liar? Did he suffer any mental illness? Was he deceived by the devil himself, thinking he was getting revelation from an angel? And finally, what is he asking us to do if we believe him? If a religious leader, for example, is known to be a criminal, or if he's asking us to give him 10% of our monthly income, like what the church did in the Middle Ages, I will have doubts. If a religious leader, for example, is asking us to put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys, like in the Bible 1 Samuel 15, I will also have doubts. But if the religious leader is known to be a pious man, a perfect example for humanity, and is only asking us to do good while empowering his message with supernatural miracles. Only then I will follow him. Today I will cover the pious man part. Then I will cover the ordering only good part in the next video explaining the Sharia law, inshallah. They claim that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, invented the whole prophethood story just to gain more money. But we're lucky enough to have his complete detailed day-to-day -day biography. We can look at his financial situation before his message and compare it to after he started preaching Islam all the way to his death. Before Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, got his first revelation, before there was any sign of prophethood, he was a young man who inherited the business of his wealthy father. Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib and he was being taken care of by his wealthy uncle Abu Talib ibn Abdul Muttalib then in his 20s he was trusted by one of the wealthiest women in Mecca she's called Khadija he ran her business for her in today's terms she was the owner of the business while he was the CEO of the business she was impressed by his manners and by how trustworthy he was Later, she asked him to marry her, and he agreed, and they got married. He spent 15 years of his life as one of the well-respected, wealthy men in Mecca. 
This was his condition at the day he received revelation. Inherited from a wealthy father, then a wealthy uncle took care of him, then married to a wealthy businesswoman. Now let's take some snippets from his life after he started preaching Islam. And we compare and see if Islam made him richer and more honored, or was it the exact opposite? Snippet number one, the valley of Abu Talib. After the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him started preaching Islam, the pagan leaders did not like the fact that he was gaining more and more loyal followers every day. You all know the atrocities they did to the early Muslims in the beginning. Torture, killing, humiliation, and more. Then they decided to cut off all the Muslims from all resources. Muslims had to suffer three years of death-threatening lack of food and economic ban. Three years, Muslims living in an open-air prison. They began to eat leaves of trees. They were sucking on the roots of some shrubs, trying to suck drops of water from it. Whoever found a rotten dead animal skin would celebrate, as he has something rotten to show on instead of dying. They became frail, they became sick and weak. Because of these three years, the ex, the ex rich prophet suffered the famine. His rich businesswoman wife died. And his rich uncle, caregiver, protector also died. This example shows how the prophet's financial status greatly decreased because of his message, not the opposite. If you want to read more about this, you can just write in Google the valley of Abu Talib and the year of sorrow. Snippet number two, rejecting the biggest bribe. The pagans of Mecca started to give up on violence. The torture, the killing, and the famine did not work. The Muslims' faith was very strong and could not be broken even by death itself. This is when they tried a different approach. They offered the Prophet a bribe instead. They said, The message you are preaching is causing us a lot of issues with our community and our businesses. If you want wealth to stop, we will make you the richest out of us. If you want honor to stop, we will make you the most honored. If you want women, we can get you all the women you want. Whatever you are after, we will provide for you, but please stop preaching this new religion. And we all know his famous response. Oh my uncle, tell them, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand in exchange of me leaving this mission, I will never leave it. I will never stop preaching the message of Islam and I will die trying to deliver it. This example shows how ridiculous the Islamophobic claim that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him made up the Quran seeking wealth. If so, why didn't he take the wealth offered to him as a bribe? You can read more about this here. Snippet number three, the immigration from Mecca. By the way, that does not only apply to the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him, that applies to all the early Muslims. After the pagans tried everything, humiliation, torture, putting the Muslims in an open-air prison, forcing a famine on them, also tried bribing the Prophet, everything that they tried failed. So the only solution left for them was the complete murder and annihilation of every Muslim. This is when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, started looking for another city to take him and the Muslims as refugees. The Prophet and all of the Muslims had to leave everything behind and immigrate as refugees to a faraway city. No one could take anything with him. Men had businesses, men had land, men had livestock, men had shops, men had houses. They had to leave all of that behind and migrate to Medina with nothing. Yesterday, one man of them was a millionaire. Today, he's a broke refugee, living as a guest in the home of one of the amazing people who accepted them. This point in history marks the loss of every bit of wealth that the Prophet had, as well as any one of his followers. This shows how they chose Allah over all of their belongings. Now, you tell me, 
Islamophobes claim that he lied about God trying to gain money. Is that the case or is it the exact opposite? Snippet number four. Tying up a rock. Jabir radiallahu anhu narrates, On the day of Al-Ahzab, I saw the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him tying up a rock on his stomach with a rope from the extreme hunger pain. The same, by the way, was narrated by Anas radiallahu anhu. I found the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him teaching Surah An-Nisa from the Quran to the poor people of Medina. While he was tying up a rock on his stomach with a rope from the extreme hunger pain. The same was also narrated by Abu Talha. These examples show how the Prophet's financial status greatly decreased because of his message, not the opposite. You can read more about that here. Some might ask, does that mean that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was a poor man throughout all of his life? And surprisingly, the answer is no, he was not. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, gained a lot of money throughout his life, but he never kept it for himself or used it for his own pleasures. On the contrary, he always used it to help the poor and the needy. And that leads us to snippet number five. Ahlu Sufa. Ahlu Sufa were the poor people of Medina. One of them was called Abu Huraira. I'm sure you heard about him. He narrated, Every time the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, received any money, he would give it to the poor people of Medina. And every time he received a present, he would share it with the poor people of Medina. Do you think this is a man who fabricated a religion for his own personal gain? You can read more about this here. Snippet number 6. Dunya is a traveler's break. One day, Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. He found the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, sleeping on a low-quality carpet called al-Hasir. This is al-Hasir, by the way, if you're not familiar with it. It is a very cheap carpet that is made from cuts of palm trees. It's very harsh on the skin and it leaves red marks if you sleep on it. Anyway, Umar found the Prophet sleeping on Hasir and he found his money chest empty. His money chest had some barley in it. This day, Omar cried. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, asked Omar, Why are you crying, Omar? Omar said, O Prophet of Allah, this cheap carpet left marks all over your body. And look at your money chest. All you have in it is some barley. Why don't you have money? Look at the king of Rome. Look at the king of Persia. Their people surround them with fruits and rivers, while we do nothing for you. And you are higher than kings. You are the prophet of Allah and his choice. You are the best of humanity. Look at your life. Then the prophet said, Omar, Aren't you pleased that they get this life and we get the next one? Omar said, yes. And in another narration, the prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, Mali walid dunya. Who cares about this life? إنما مثلي ومثل الدنيا كراكب استظل تحت شجرة ثم راح وترك. The example of this life to me is like the example of a traveler who stopped to take a break under a tree. Then after a while he continued his journey. This is the whole life, a traveler's break. When the traveler takes a break, he would not complain about the quality of the tree. It is temporary anyway. It doesn't really matter to him as he is only thinking about his real destination, the Jannah. Do you think this is a man who fabricated the religion to gain more money? Is this Islamophobic claim really rational? You can read more about this here and also here. Snippet number seven, his wife's complaint. Although the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was completely satisfied with his humble lifestyle, his wives knew that he had a considerable income that he kept spending on the poor every time. They wanted him to spend a little less on the poor and a little more on them. So they complained about his humble lifestyle and asked for more. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, didn't like that. And then Allah revealed verse 28 in Surah al ahzab O Prophet, tell your wives, if you care too much about the worldly pleasures, I will give you all the worldly pleasures you want, 
but I will let you go. In other words, you can live with the Prophet his humble life, or he will let you go gracefully, and he will also give you all the money you want. Do you still think that this is a man who invented a religion to take money from his followers and spend it on himself? Snippet number 8 I'm fasting today. Mother Haisha narrates the following. One day the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him woke up hungry. He asked me, do we have any food in the house? I told him, Ya Rasulullah, ma indana shay. No, we don't have any food, O Prophet of Allah. Then he said, fa inni sa'im. Okay, I will fast today. This example shows how the Prophet's financial status greatly decreased because of his message, not the opposite. You can read more about it here. Snippet number 9. Month without cooking. Mother Aisha radiallahu anha narrates. كنا لننظر إلى الهلال ثم الهلال وما أوقدت في أبيات رسول الله نار. Month after month after month used to pass without any cooking fire being lit in the Prophet's houses. Plural. This man was a wealthy businessman before he started preaching Islam and after preaching he spent month after month after month without cooking fire in any of his house. You can read more about it here. Snippet number 10. This man does not fear poverty. Muslims defeated the pagans in the battle of Hunayn and the spoils of war were massive. The spoils included 24,000 camels, 40,000 sheep, and 4,000 bags of silver coins. This is the equivalent today of hundreds of millions of US dollars. 20% of these spoils were under the control of the Prophet himself. That is more than winning the lottery, right? What would you do with 20% of hundreds of millions of dollars? Let me tell you what the Prophet did with it. He gave, and he gave, and he gave, and he gave. He gave more than anyone could imagine. Even the disbelievers said to each other, Believe this man. This man is not a liar. This is a man who does not fear poverty because his Lord will give him whatever he wants. Now guess, how much did he keep for himself after distributing these hundreds of millions of dollars? I hope you guessed correctly. Not one penny. Nothing. He gave away all of them. Ask yourself, is this a man looking for money? Is this a con man fabricating a religion to increase his wealth? If so, why didn't he keep these millions of dollars to himself? No one would have objected, by the way. If you want more about this, Google the Battle of Hunayn. Snippet number 11. His deathbed. Before the death of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, he was lying down in the house of Mother Aisha. He asked her, how much money do we have? She said, we have around seven dirhams. He said, ما ظن محمد بالله عز وجل لو لقيه وهذه عنده أنفقيها. How can I meet Allah without spending these seven dirhams? Go spend it on the poor right away. Amr ibn al-Harris said, ما ترك النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إلا سلاحه وبغلته البيضاء. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him did not leave anything after his death except a sword and a white donkey. By the way, he also had a shield that was mortgaged to one of the people of the book. That's it. Is this a man who fabricated a religion to take people's money for himself? Where is it then? Snippet number 12. The testimonies. Mother Aisha said, The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, died, and he never filled his stomach with bread and fat twice in a day. She also said, Our family never filled our stomach three days in a row until his death. Umar ibn al-Khattab once said, I used to see the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, suffering hunger pain until he finds a date to eat. Abu Huraira said, I swear by Allah, I never saw the Prophet's family fill their stomachs with bread three days in a row, until he died. And of course, there are more narrations. What I need to focus on now 
these 12 snippets of his life render the Islamophobic claim completely ridiculous. But if you know me, you already know that I will not stop here. I'm not a man who just defends Islam against a claim and just go peacefully, right? Check this out. Allah made a criteria in the Quran to help us differentiate between a real and a fake prophet. ما أريد منهم من رزق وما أريد أي طعمون. God is self-sufficient. He will not send a prophet to ask people to give money to God himself. The easiest way to spot a fake prophet or a fake religion is to check if he is asking people to give him money or to make sacrifices to God himself. The temple priests in ancient Egypt asked people to give wheat and money to the god Amun. Then, after people go away from the temple, they will just take these sacrifices and money for themselves. The temple priests in ancient Jerusalem asked people to do the same. They asked people to sacrifice animals to the god residing inside the temple, right? The medieval church asked all people to give 10% of their income to the church. They called it tithing. You can Google it if you want. And because 10% of all the wealth of all Europeans was not enough for the fat church fathers, they started to sell good deeds certificates or get out of hell cards. If you are lazy to pray, if you don't want to do a lot of good deeds, don't worry. Give us your money and we will sell you some prayers. They called it the indulgement parchments. Do you like the shape of the good deeds certificate? They made a good design though, even though there was no Photoshop back then. Can you see the difference between all of those examples? And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, ordering us to give charity to the poor. To the poor, not to him. To the poor, not to the temple god. Compare the financial status of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, throughout his life until his death, to the financial status to any of the medieval popes or the temple priests in Jerusalem. Please read with me part of Surah Yasin. It is a story that happened long time ago when Allah sent three messengers to a pagan village. قالوا ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا وما أنزل الرحمن من شيء إن أنتم إلا تكذبون. Disbelievers said to the messengers, "You are liars. God did not send any message. We will continue to obey our temple priests." قالوا ربنا يعلم إن إليكم لمرسلون وما علينا إلا البلاغ المبين. Then the messengers said, "Allah knows that we're not liars. Our job is only to deliver the message to you." It's your choice if you want to believe or not. وجاء من أقصى المدينة رجل يسعى قال يا قوم اتبعوا المرسلين A man came rushing from the other side of the city and said People, you should follow the messengers. اتبعوا من لا يسألكم أجروا وهم مهتدون The proof that they are messengers of God is that they are not asking you for money as our temple priests do. There is no real God that will ask people to give him money. That doesn't make any sense. Those messengers are real and our temple priests are fake. I hope you got the message. They claim that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, invented the whole prophethood story just to gain more honor and respect. He basically wanted people to worship him. But we are lucky to have his complete detailed day-to-day biography. So let's see was that the reality or not. Let's look at his social status before the message of Islam and compare it to after he started preaching all the way to his death. Before Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him got his first revelation. Before there was any sign of prophethood. He had an exceptional status in his society anyway. First, he was from an honored family. His father was a successful businessman and his uncle was a successful businessman. And also his wife was a successful businesswoman. Second, he had the most respected family lineage in whole Arabia. He was the grandson of Ishmael and Abraham, peace and blessing upon both. Third, his community had two titles for him. As-Sadiq, Al-Amin. As-Sadiq means the one who says only the truth. Al-Amin means the trustworthy one. 
please remember this was before the revelation and all of that is well documented also it's important to mention that tribal society are not like our society today back then in the tribal society literally everyone knew each other nothing happens in any family unless the whole community knows about it so for someone back then to be called the trustworthy truthful one that was impossible to fake when the tribes of Mecca had their famous disagreement with each other about who puts the last building stone in the Kaaba, they had to choose one judge. One man whom everyone would accept his judgment. No one would disagree and no one would accuse him of being biased. They only trusted one man of all the people. The only person that all people from all tribes agreed to trust his judgment on their dispute was Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Again, that was before he became a prophet. That's how trusted and respected he was. This was his status in the first 40 years of his life, until Allah revealed the first message to him. Now, let's look how everything changed to the worse after the revelation. Snippet number one, the first announcement. The prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, stood on high ground and asked everyone to gather. Then he said, if I tell you that there is a big army behind this mountain that is about to conquer you, will you believe me? They said, of course, you never lied to us throughout your life. Why wouldn't we believe you? Then he said, okay, then I want to announce that I am a messenger from God to you. This is when his honor, reputation and his trustworthiness took a U-turn. They said, you are a liar. This was the first time anyone ever told him you are a liar in his whole life. Later, they called him a madman, they called him a poet, they called him a magician. The part that I want to focus on right now is, did he gain more honor, reputation and respect by preaching Islam or was it the exact opposite? Does it make sense to claim that he fabricated a religion to gain more honor? Snippet number two. The people of at -Tai. After the pagans of Mecca humiliated, starved, tortured, and killed the Muslims for years, after the Prophet lost his wife and protector uncle, he started to look for other cities who would accept Islam and take the Muslims as refugees. One of those cities was called the city of at -Taif. Normally, you would expect the people of at -Taif to say yes or no respectfully and to treat him as a guest. But this was far from what happened. The Prophet walked 60 miles in the desert just for a chance to talk to them. And they, instead of treating him as a guest with respect, they humiliated him. They insulted him and they made two lines to his right and to his left. All the kids and slaves in the city kept calling him bad names and throwing rocks at him while he was trying to walk away. That is, until his clothes were filled with blood and his heart was completely broken with the disgrace and the lack of honor. Years after this incident, Mother Aisha asked the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, about the hardest day in his life. He said it was the day of At-Taif. It was the hardest day for him, even though he suffered more physical pain throughout his life. But this day, the humiliation was unbearable. Imagine kids calling your name and throwing rocks at you. He said, after I got out of a taif, while I was drowning in my blood, Jibreel came to me and offered me to kill all of them. I said, no, don't. بَلْ أَرْجُوا أَنْ يُخْرِجَ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَصْلَابِهِمْ مَا يَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ وَحْدَهُ لَا يُشْرِكْ بِهِ شَيْئًا Don't kill any of them. Maybe Allah will guide their children or their grandchildren to worship him alone. And you know what? Those people in a taif today are one of the most righteous people in the world. Subhanallah. One of the Prophet's famous supplications was, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka da'fa quwwati wa qilla tahilati wa hawani ala nas. Allah, I complain to you about my weakness and my lack of influence and how people treat me as if I'm nothing. Illam yakun bika alayya ghadabun fala ubali. But Allah, if you are satisfied with me, then I don't care about anything else. The question now is, is it fair for Islamophobes to claim that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, fabricated a religion to gain more honor and respect from his people? Or was it the exact opposite? Snippet number three, extreme humiliation. 
Maybe people don't feel the same today, especially in some Western cultures. But for us until today, to an Arab man, humiliation is much, much more painful than physical torture. Honor is more important than well-being. One day, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, wanted to pray in front of the Kaaba. Abu Jahl came and he said, if you prostrate here, I will put my legs on your neck and I will swipe your face over the dust of the earth and I will torture you. Another day, the pagans said, if you prostrate to God in front of the Kaaba, we will put dirty animal intestines, dirty intestines of a dead camel on your head. You know what? They actually did it. While he was prostrating, they threw dirty animal intestines on his head, his shoulders and his back, and they kept laughing at him. Imagine the humiliation. His young daughter Fatima, she came running to him and she started removing the dirty intestines from him while he was prostrating so he can get up. The question is now, is it fair for Islamophobes to claim that Muhammad fabricated a religion to gain more honor and more respect from his people? Or was it the exact opposite? You can read more about this here. Snippet number four, his personal life. Mother Aisha was once asked about what the Prophet did in his home. She said he used to wash his clothes and milk his goat and serve himself. He used to mend his sandals and sew his clothes himself. He used to serve his family members until it's time for prayer, then he goes to the mosque. Now the question is, does that look like an arrogant man who is asking people to worship him? He didn't even ask his wife to serve him. On the contrary, he served her. You can read more about this here. Snippet number five. Don't raise my honor. Most of the early Muslims were previously pagan or from the people of the book. And in these man-made religions, they are used to raising their religious leaders to godlike levels. Then, when they accepted Islam in the beginning, they started to do the same to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him himself. Some of them thought that they can get blessing by touching him. Some of them thought they can get blessing by touching his sweat. Some of them were trying to do what was more extreme. When Mu'az, for example, came back from Hashem, he met the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Then he asked the Prophet's permission to prostrate to him. Prostrate. The Prophet immediately condemned that and said, a human should never prostrate to another human like him. And the Prophet also said, لا تطروني كما أطرت النصارى ابن مريم إنما أنا عبد فقولوا عبد الله ورسوله Do not raise my status like what the Christians did to Jesus, the son of Mary. I am just a slave of Allah like you. Call me the slave of Allah and his messenger. Now the question is, wasn't this a great opportunity for a fake prophet seeking honor and respect to achieve his goals? People literally wanted to prostrate to him. Wasn't this a great opportunity to let people worship him as, you know, you claim? Is it fair for Islamophobes to claim that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, sought any of that? Snippet number six, the eclipse. One day, the followers of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, saw the sun eclipse. Before we read the story, there is something that we have to put into perspective first. When the sun eclipse happens in front of our eyes today, we celebrate it, we make a fun day out of it. That is because we learn about sun eclipses in schools and on the news. We expect it to happen, we know it's completely normal. But for Arabs in the 7th century, this was something extremely scary. They never saw that ever before in their lives. They didn't have schools to learn about it. And they didn't know what is causing it. It's weird. They might have thought that it was the end of the world or something. Now the interesting part. The sun eclipse happened immediately after the death of the Prophet's son. Mm. The early Muslims, out of ignorance, assumed that the sun eclipse was because of the sorrow of the Prophet over his dead son. If he was a fake Prophet seeking honor and status, this was a very, very good opportunity. All he had to do was to shut up. And people would keep talking about how the son shut off because he lost his son. If he just shut up, 
he would become a legend. But he didn't. He did the exact opposite. He said, Inna shamsa wal qamara la yankasifan li mawti ahadin wala li hayati. The sun doesn't eclipse for anyone's death or life. It has nothing to do with the death of my son. Instead of thinking like that, pray to God and supplicate. Again, the question now is, is it fair for Islamophobes to claim that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, fabricated a religion to ask people to worship him? Why didn't he let them though? Snippet number seven, an ifk incident. Again, I don't know about the Western culture, but in our culture, the most extreme way you can disgrace a man is by talking bad about one of his female family members. Maybe about his mother, maybe about his wife or his daughter. An Arab man would prefer to take 1000 insults on himself, but he would never take one insult about his wife, mother or daughter. The hypocrites in Medina know that, right? So they spread a rumor about the wife of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. They said she was an adulterous woman. This was as harsh an attack on the Prophet's honor as it gets. If he was a false prophet, what would you expect from him? Exactly. He would immediately say, I know everything and these people are liars and maybe order their killing. But the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, had to endure one whole month, whole month before his wife's reputation was cleared. One whole month without using any prophethood or leadership privileges to defend himself or his family's reputation. The question again is, is it fair for Islamophobes to claim that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, fabricated the religion to make people worship him? Snippet number eight, his humbleness. When Ibn Mas'ud talked to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, in the beginning he was expecting him to be like a tyrant or a king. You know, like the king of Persia, the king of Rome, this is what people were used to. So, Ibn Mas'ud's body was shaking out of fear. The Prophet told him, Hawin alayk, fa'inni lastu bi malik. Calm down, Ibn Mas'ud, I'm not a king. Why are you afraid? Innama ana ibn mra'atim min Quraysh kanat ta'kul al-qadid. I am just a normal man. I am the son of a woman who used to eat cheap food. Allah commanded the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him in Surah Ash-Shu'ara. وَخْفِدْ جَنَاحَكَ لِمَنِ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Lower your wings and humble yourself to your followers. Again, the question is now, is it fair for Islamophobes to claim that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him fabricated a religion to make people worship him? Or is it the exact opposite? Snippet number 9. Praising early prophets. Abraham is mentioned in the Quran 69 times. Moses is mentioned in the Quran 136 times. Jesus is mentioned in the Quran 25 times. Noah is mentioned in the Quran 43 times. Muhammad is mentioned in the Quran only 5 times. The question is, if Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him was fabricating the Quran to gain status, honor and respect, why does the Quran mention him the least times compared to all of these prophets? Is it fair for Islamophobes to claim that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, fabricated a religion to make people worship him, or is it the exact opposite? Snippet number 10, the Quran correcting the Prophet. One day, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was debating the leaders of the pagan Arabs. He had high hopes. If the pagan leaders accepted Islam, all of their followers would immediately follow, right? And while he was debating them, a blind man came and asked him to teach him some Qur'an. The Prophet then frowned and postponed the man later after the debate is over. Allah then revealed Surah Abasa, condemning the Prophet's action. Peace and blessing be upon him. Abasa wa tawalla an a'ma. He frowned and turned his attention away from the blind guy when he came to him. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ أو يذكر فتنفعه الذكرى. You never know a prophet. Perhaps he might be purified if you teach him, or he might be mindful. The reminder might benefit him. Why did you turn away from him? Allah also corrected the prophet's actions in Surah at tahrim 66 1. Allah also declared that the prophet is just a man like us in Surah Fussilat 41 6. Allah also declared that the Prophet does not have the knowledge of the unseen in Surah Al-Ahraf 7, 188. The question is now, 
if he was a false prophet fabricating the Quran to convince people to praise him and worship him, why would he write a Quran that keeps condemning his actions and putting down his status like that? Think about it. This is the reality of the man that the Islamophobes are attacking day and night. This is the man they don't accept as the example for humanity. Subhanallah. They claim that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, invented the whole prophethood story just to gain women and worldly pleasures. I know this claim is funny for anyone who has basic knowledge in Sira, but I will quickly debunk it for those who don't know. Before the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, started preaching Islam to his people, there were two cultures in Arabia, the pagans and the people of the book. Regarding the pagans, they treated women as property anyway. And the pagan men can have one million women and no one would be surprised. And regarding the people of the book, well, we still have a copy of their Bible until today anyway. For example, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, right? Abraham had three wives, David had eight wives, Jacob had four wives. People of the book had no upper limit for marriages and no upper limit for concubines whatsoever. The question is to the idiots making this claim. Why would he invent a new religion to do something that was already normal in his community? Especially knowing that he was a rich businessman anyway who could get whatever he wanted. Do you hear yourselves when you make these claims? Also, as we discussed in the second chapter of this video, when the pagans offered him a bribe to stop preaching Islam, the bribe included wealth, power, and women. Why didn't he just take the bribe? And as we discussed in the third chapter of this video, he was serving himself in his home and serving his wife. Even good men today rarely do that. I don't want to spend too much time on this because all of these subjects have been discussed in detail in the Women in Islam playlist. Watch Nada complains to Aisha to know everything in detail about the Prophet's private life with his wife. Watch Age of Aisha definitive refutation video for a complete debunk of all the Islamophobic claims regarding his marriages. No need to repeat it here. All I want to mention now is a part of his last speech before his death. Oh people, the devil has lost all hope of being worshipped in this land of yours. Nevertheless, he will try to mislead you in small matters. Beware of him for the safety of your religion. O oh people, every Muslim is a brother to every Muslim. It is only lawful to take from a brother what he gives you willingly, so don't wrong yourselves. O oh people, treat your women well and be kind to them, for they are your partners and your committed helpers. You have taken them only as a trust from Allah, and you have their enjoyment only by his permission. This was the man that you are attacking day and night. Subhanallah. After we established that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, had the reputation of being the truthful and trustworthy before he started preaching Islam, we established that he didn't gain anything from his message. He didn't gain wealth, he didn't gain honor, he didn't gain women, he didn't gain worldly desires. We established that he lived a humble life, asking people to do good until his last breath. Yet Islamophobes still claim he was a liar. So let's fully end this claim once and for all. For someone to claim to be a prophet, either he was the worst liar, deceiver and criminal, or he was the most honest human being chosen by God. It can't be anything in the middle. And it's not that hard to differentiate between the worst liar and the most righteous, right? Maybe someone with extremely low IQ would not differentiate. But I don't think that those billions of Muslims, all of them have low IQ, right? I think you would agree with me unless racism really blinded you. Allah made the same argument, by the way, to the pagans in Surah Yunus. 
I have lived my whole life among you before the revelation. Why don't you understand? You know Muhammad for 40 years already before the revelation. You know that he never lied. You know that he was the trusted choice as a judge for all the tribes. And for someone to fabricate a lie about God, this someone should be the worst human being on earth. You lived with him in a small community where everyone knew each other. And everyone testified to his truthfulness. Why do you reject him now? Is it because you don't like the commands of God that he's delivering to you? Is it because this is the only way you can avoid righteousness? Are you sure you really doubt him or you just wanna doubt him? Because there is a huge difference. Let me open your eyes to something very important. Any public figure today or any celebrity should have a PR team. This PR team will tell him what to say, what not to say, how to react, how to take a picture, and so on. They make sure that his image in the eyes of his fans is as lovely as possible. They make sure that his ugly side stays hidden. They also tell him not to appear in front of the camera a lot, as the more he speaks publicly, the more inevitably he will make mistakes. It is better for any celebrity to show up less and to prepare a lot to produce more quality content. Now let's apply these PR rules on the life of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. We will see the exact opposite. His whole life was recorded, and I mean the word by the way, whole life. His relationship with the believers and his private relationship with his family. Even every little detail like what did he eat today? Or on which side did he sleep on his bed? I dare any celebrity today to reveal every little detail about his private life and still have one fan after that. People will just see him for what he really is. But the Prophet's life was even reported by his wives. And even if you fool the whole world, you will never fool your wives too. And those wives stayed alive for years and years after the Prophet's death. If they saw something wrong, they could have just told about it after his death. Hudayfa, may Allah be pleased with him, reported, I prayed with the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, one night. He started reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. I thought that he would bow down after the end of 100 verses, for example. But he proceeded on. I thought he would perhaps recite the whole Surah and then stop. But he proceeded on. He finished Surah Al-Baqarah. Then he started with Surah An-Nisa and finished it. And then he started with Surah Ali Imran and finished it. All of that in one raqah. That is about, by the way, two hours of reciting. Wait, I'm not finished. Then he bowed down. And he stayed bowing down the same time as he stood. Then he prostrated on the floor. And he stayed down on the floor prostrating the same time as he stood reciting. That is one raqah, one prayer that lasted six hours. Is this the most pious man or the worst liar in history? If you read Surat Al-Muzzammil, you will see how the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was praying half of the night every night all his life. Is it that hard for you to differentiate between the most righteous man and the worst criminal? Really? They claim that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, suffered from mental illness. As we already established, it is impossible to claim that he was a liar. And the only other explanation left is to say that he was delusional. He was a crazy man who thought that an angel is coming to him, but in reality nothing happened. It's all mental illness. Let's debunk this claim too. While debunking this claim, I will look at it from a non-Muslim perspective. Okay, starting now, I am pretending to be a non-Muslim. Let's say I will tell you about a man who deceived 1,000 people and convinced all of them one by one to obey him blindly, even to lose their money and lose their lives for him. Your response will be, this man is a genius, right? How did he do that? Genius. What about a man who, quote-unquote, deceived billions of people, a quarter of all humanity. Was he a genius? Or did he suffer mental illness? 
What about a man who also led a successful country, a president of a successful country, and also led armies to very, very impressive victories? Victories that are near impossible from a disbeliever's perspective. Was he a genius or a crazy man? Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, is objectively and undeniably the greatest and the most influential human being in history. He is the only human in history who managed to create an entire civilization all by himself. He unified Arabia, revolutionized, reformed, and transformed a backward, desert-dwelling tribal society into one nation that obliterated and brought to its knees two world superpowers, Rome and Persia, and established itself as a new political and spiritual superpower for centuries and still counting. He brought laws, morals, societal regulations, a dietary system, a dress code, and an all-encompassing and complete way of life that billions of people follow today. He brought a book which was and is a linguistic miracle that serves as a basis for modern Arabic grammar, and which became and still remains the most read book and recited book in history and is memorized by hundreds of millions of people today. He was an excellent and unmatched politician, statesman, diplomat, warrior, general, commander, lawgiver, judge, public speaker, religious preacher, devoted husband, loyal companion, loving father, and faithful friend. He was loved by his followers, his family, and he was respected by his enemies. He did all that while being a desert-dwelling orphan in the middle of nowhere who couldn't read or write and he didn't attend any universities and he didn't have any human mentors or guides. This is Reginald Smith, the Christian British historian. Let's read together what he said about Muhammad. He was Caesar and the Pope in one, but he was Pope without Pope's pretensions, Caesar without the legions of Caesar, without a standing army, without a bodyguard, without a palace, without a fixed revenue. If ever any man had the right to say that he ruled by the right divine, it was Muhammad. For he had all the power without the instruments and without its support. He cared not for the dressing of power. The simplicity of his private life was in keeping with his public life. Remember, this is a Christian historian. This is William Watt the Christian Scottish Orientalist, historian, academic, and priest. Let's read what he wrote about Muhammad. His readiness to undergo persecution for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader, and the greatness of his ultimate achievement, all argue for his fundamental integrity. To suppose Muhammad as an imposter raises more problems than it solves. Moreover, none of the great figures of history is so poorly appreciated in the West as Muhammad. Remember, he was an academic and he was an angelical priest. This is Jules Masserman, the Jewish psychoanalyst and professor in Chicago University, United States. Let's read what he wrote about Muhammad. Leaders must fulfill three functions. Provide for the well-being of the lead provide a social organization in which people feel relatively secure, and provide them with one set of beliefs. People like Pastor and Salk are leaders in the first sense. People like Gandhi and Confucius are on one hand, and Alexander and Caesar on the other are leaders in the second and perhaps the third sense. Jesus and Buddha belong to the third category alone. Perhaps the greatest leader of all times was Muhammad, who combined the three functions. To a lesser degree, Moses did the same. Remember, Jewish professor in Chicago University. This is Mahatma Gandhi, a Hindu as well as an Indian lawyer and the leader of the anti-colonial movement. He led a successful campaign for India's freedom from British slavery, persecution and oppression. You all know it. Let's read what he said about Muhammad. I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, 
the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and his mission. These and not the sword carried everything before them and surmounted every obstacle. When I closed the second volume of the Prophet's biography, I was sorry that there was no more for me to read of that great life. Remember, Hindu leader. The American scientist, philosopher, physician, chemist, historian, and photographer. He was also the first president of the American Chemical Society and the founder of the New York University School of Medicine. Now let's read what he said about Muhammad. For years after the death of Justinian, AD 569, was born in Mecca in Arabia, a man who of all men has exercised the greatest influence upon the human race. Muhammad, to be the religious head of many empires, to guide the daily life of one third of the human race, may perhaps justify the title of a messenger of God. This is George Schaub, the Irish writer and the winner of the Nobel Prize of Literature in 1925. Let's read what he said about Muhammad. I have prophesied about the faith of Muhammad that it would be accepted to the Europe of tomorrow, as it is beginning to be acceptable in Europe today. I believe that if a man like him were to assume the dictatorship of the modern world, he would succeed in solving its problems in a way that would bring it the much-needed peace and happiness. Subhanallah. This is James Gavin, the Christian senior United States Army officer, with the rank Lieutenant General in World War II. Let's read what he said about Muhammad. Among leaders who have made the great impact through the ages, I would consider Muhammad before Jesus Christ. Subhanallah. This is Michael Hart, the American astrophysicist, author, and researcher. He published a book called The 100, A Ranking of the Most Influential People in History. Even though he was a disbeliever, he still had to put Muhammad first on his list. Let's read what he said about Muhammad. My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and the secular levels. And finally, I want to end up with one more piece of information. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was not the only one who saw Angel Jibreel alayhi salam. The Prophet's friends also saw the angel. We have no time to read it in detail, but if you want to learn more about it, please read this authentic Sahih narration. Now it's time to ask you a very, very silly question. Is it possible for a crazy man, a madman, to achieve all that? And because they don't accept his impressive, accurate prophecies that we talked about in the Prophet's Time Machine video, or all the scientific miracles in Quran and Hadith that we talked about in all of these videos that you can see on the screen, they would claim that a man called Muhammad, who could not read or write in the 7th century, was expert in geology, meteorology, oceanology, physics, embryology, medicine, biology, psychology, botany, zoology, archaeology, poetry, politics, law, economics, and everything else. They will claim that he was extremely, extremely, extremely lucky in guessing events from the past or from his near future or from the faraway future. They will claim that all of his amazing physical miracles was, you know, tricks to the eye because he was very smart and he can trick people. And then they will claim that he was crazy and a madman. Choose one of them. How come you claim he's brilliant and expert in everything? and at the same time claims that he was crazy? Choose one of them. Islamophobes making these claims are just exposing themselves, exposing their lack of judgment and their enslavement to their desires that is blinding them. They don't really care if they sound ridiculous, they don't care if they make sense or not, they would say anything to avoid obeying the commands of God. My advice is, stop humiliating yourself, it's not worth it. 
Stop it. Get some help. They claim that Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him was deceived by the devil. As we already established, it is impossible to claim that he was a liar and it is impossible to claim that he was crazy. So the only way out, the only explanation they have left is to say that he was deceived by the devil. You know, the devil came to him pretending to be an angel sent by God to convince him to preach a false religion to the people. I'm sorry guys if I'm wasting your time responding to this stupid nonsense, but please bear with me. We need to close all the doors in front of the Islamophobes. First of all, this claim cannot come from an atheist because, you know, atheists don't believe in the devil to begin with. So this claim can only come from a Christian, right? Okay, dear Christians, please listen carefully to your claim. Arabs were pagan, pagan idol worshippers. Then Satan, the devil, deceived one man from the pagan idol worshippers, right? To convince the other idol worshippers to stop worshipping idol and worship one God. Hmm. And uh, by the way, he also told him to tell his people to beware of Satan because Satan is their enemy. Hmm. Satan ordered the pagan Arabs to be good to their neighbors, to pay charity, to take good care of their parents, and to take good care of their wives. Satan ordered the pagan Arabs not to break family ties, not to kill, not to steal, not to cheat, not to be racist, not to get drunk, not to backbite, not to gossip. Satan. You know what? I will leave a link in the description to a video that summarizes the whole Sharia law. Watch it fully and then tell me, is this from Satan or not? What I want to emphasize now is, the Quran repeats the same warning in a lot of chapters. Don't be deceived by Satan. Satan is your enemy. Satan deceived your father, Adam. Don't fall into the steps of Satan. For example, يَا بَنِي آدَمَ لَا يَفْتِنَنَّكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ وَكَمَا أَخْرَجَ أَبَوَيْكُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ O oh, children of Adam, don't let Satan deceive you like he tempted your parents out of paradise. إنما يريد الشيطان أن يوقع بينكم العداوة والبغضاء في الخمر والميسر ويصدكم عن ذكر الله. Satan's plan is to stir up hostility and hatred between you. With intoxicants, with gambling, he wants to prevent you from remembering Allah and praying. Will you not then abstain? وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله. If you are tempted by the devil, then seek refuge with Allah. Surely he is all hearing, all knowing. فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ When you recite the Qur'an, seek refuge with Allah from the accursed Satan. وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِرَبِّهِ كَفُورًا Satan is kafir. The devil is kafir. Then after all that, a low IQ Christian Islamophobe would say, Satan is the author of the Qur'an. He will claim that Satan wrote a book warning us from Satan. You know what? I will not respond to you. I will let your Bible respond to you instead of me. Open the New Testament and open Matthew 12.25. You will find Jesus saying, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? Your Bible says that Satan cannot divide against himself. By claiming that the Quran was written by Satan, you lose in two ways. First, you become a laughing material for every kid on the internet. Second, you attack your own Bible. You go against what your Jesus is teaching you. I hope this claim is buried forever. Can Satan oppose himself? Can Satan oppose himself? Probably if he looks in the mirror. According to your scripture, can Satan <laughs> oppose himself? I don't know. Can Satan stand against himself? No. If the Quran stands against Satan, can Satan be the author? According to Jesus in your scripture? No, not no. Really. that's true. Right, that's, true. So that's why you hid away from that. And you were hiding in delusion. But that means that you're saying, that means you, by the same standard, you have to say that the, the Bible is the word of God as No, well. no, I don't, because this is your standard, not mine. So if you have a standard that the New Testament's reliable source of information and what Jesus says, and Jesus says something, you have agree what Jesus says or don't, as should be your position. 
And if Jesus says Satan can't oppose himself according to your position okay, you're and right, your actually, beliefs, you're right, you're right, Satan yeah. cannot be the author of the Quran. Khalas. If you reached this far in the video, first, I want to thank you for listening. And second, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, there are millions around the world who are in desperate need for the guidance of Allah to reach them. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, deliver my message, even if all you can deliver is one verse. So it's your turn now. Like and comment to boost the video's reach on YouTube, and then share it on your social media account. By the way, you can download the video and upload it to your channel. It's 100% copyright free. Finally, if you want to learn more than 200 pieces of evidence that will definitely prove to you that Islam is the truth, check out this playlist, Evidence of Islam. I am sure it will change your life forever. Link is in the description. Also, make sure you check out our playlist, Women in Islam. I'm also sure it will change your perspective. Thanks, and don't go before you listen to some Quran with me first. Salam alaikum. <laughs> وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله